Good morning. It is good to see everyone this morning. It's a joy to be with you. Uh, what a wonderful group of people you are and a good, hardworking church for the Lord. I always like being with good people of God. And you know, here's an interesting thing. If you're traveling, you go into a city you've never been into before, if you can find God's people, you're at home. Whether you know them or not, you're at home. And that's the beauty of it. I know I'm at home here. This is a special place. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. When I was a little boy, uh, the Church of Christ, the Body of Christ, was listed for a time as the fastest growing religious group in all the world. We were baptizing more people. We were growing faster than any other religious group at that time. It is sad to say that right now we do not claim that distinction any longer, uh, that others have surpassed us in their uh, missionary zeal and their evangelistic zeal. And as a result of that, in places, unfortunately, uh, the church is, is not as strong as it once was, and in some places it, it is virtu virtually disappearing. So in a, in a series of lessons in which we are together trying to discover things that need to be revived, I believe one thing that we must talk about is reviving soul winning, reaching out to the lost, being a people who love the souls of every man and woman with whom we come in contact and doing all that we can to cause them to know what the gospel of Christ is and because of that, hopefully, uh, to come to obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's for that reason this morning, for just a little while, I want to ask a question that I'll be honest with you, when, I, when it first dawned on me what I was seeing in the passage that was just read, that really the question here is, are you, am I, known in hell? Now you've already heard the story. You already know what goes on here. An evil spirit knew Jesus and Paul. And it's interesting as we look at this that this spirit uses two different words when he talks about Jesus and Paul. The first word, the one he uses for Jesus, is a word that literally means I recognize his authority. Now you might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. He didn't do what the Lord wanted him to do. No, that's true. But he recognized his authority. You may remember that James and James chapter 2, when he talks about faith without works, describes how that the devils also believe and tremble. They recognize the authority. If you turn over to the book of Mark, in Mark chapter 5, you find an incident in the life of Jesus that demonstrates that the devil and his cohorts know the authority of Jesus Christ. It begins in Mark 5, verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. When he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. Then he saw Jesus from afar, and he ran and worshipped him. Now pause just a minute. That word worship there is, is the primary word for worship in the New Testament. It means he prostrated himself before him. He fully acknowledged that Jesus was the authority in the spiritual realm. So then it goes on. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, 
Son of the Most High God, I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Well, you remember the rest of the story. You know that the spirit begged that they be allowed to go into a herd of swine. And Jesus permitted that. They went into the swine, and the swine ran headlong down into the sea, and they all died there on that occasion. But I want us to all notice that the demons knew that Jesus was and is the Son of God. What does it mean to be the Son of someone? You know, I know that we know in a sense the word, and yet in another way we don't know. Uh, the word Son of uh, carries the idea of to partake of the nature of. I had a secretary in, in Mobile where I worked almost 13 years who on occasion would see my son way down the hall walking away from her and she thought for sure it was me. He walked just like I walked. And she therefore knew. You know, that, that's a Hampton down there. She didn't know which one, but she knew it was a Hampton down that way uh, that was walking along. Now, I can tell you that I had an unusual experience at Freed Hardman. It was a college back in those days. I'm kind of old. It's a university now. Uh, but uh, we, were, we were approached. Teresa and I had just gotten married not long before. We were living in this little uh, two-bedroom house uh, down on uh, Hill Avenue. And uh, this brother, whose wife had just been hired to be the dorm mother, of the new dormitory, uh, called us and said, would you be willing to keep our dog? You know, the health department doesn't allow us to keep the dog here in the dorm. And we said, well, yeah. After we talked about it, yeah, that, that'd be fine. They said, all right, we're going to bring the dog out, we'll say Saturday. I don't know what day it was. They came out, and I knew I was in trouble. When he opened the car door, and he said, Come on, son. Now, you know as well as I do, that wasn't his son. But I know he had three daughters and no sons. Now, you want to know the rest of the story? The dog's name was Preacher. I am in trouble. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. But these demons by acknowledging that Jesus is the Son of God, are acknowledging, and by the way, the Jews in John 8, 9, 10, 11, right through there, they, they would recognize this too. That when you say you're the Son of God, you're saying you're God. Jesus is God, and they know it. They recognize that authority. Now, the word that the demon uses back in Acts 19 when he's talking about Paul and says, Paul, I know, is a different word. It's a word that means I'm acquainted with him. Uh, I had this very experience last night. I was asked if, if I knew Connie's brother. Well, his name just instantly clicked. That wasn't a problem. And by the way, after I saw his picture, I would have said, well, sure I do. I might not have called him by the right name, but I know who he is. You know, I'm familiar with him. We've met. It doesn't go much beyond that. Not because I don't want it to. just hadn't happened that way. But I'm acquainted with him. I'm acquainted with his work. I've read some of the things that he's written. I'm excited about the work that he is doing. I'm acquainted with him. Well, this, this demon, this spirit, says, I'm acquainted with Paul. And then he says, but who are you? And that was where I was driven to this important question that we're going to be talking about a little bit further as we go along. I want you to think just a minute. In Ephesus, they had what was called the Ephesian uh, Gramata. It's not important you remember that. Uh, you know, my mom and dad paid a lot of money for me to learn a bunch of facts that are almost useless. 
and I try to use them every now and then so they get their money's worth. Uh, it was six words, is what it was, that they would say that they thought opened the door to magical powers. So these uh, exorcists, and an exorcist was someone who said words that were intended to do a good work, what they were intended to do, miraculous type of work, but a work, good work nonetheless. These uh, exorcists uh, realized that, hey, there's some kind of power Paul has that we don't have. They may have been saying those six words every day, but they didn't have the impact of what Paul had as he came to Ephesus. And so, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, we urge you to come out. But the Spirit doesn't recognize them. So for the rest of the time, let's look just a little bit and think about the significance of what we're dealing with here. The demons recognize the power of the Lord. We've already seen that in Mark chapter 5. And that power is very, very important. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, you'll remember that the writer to the early first century Hebrew Christians said, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. The word destroy doesn't mean to totally annihilate. The devil will not be totally annihilated as far as Scripture is concerned. But in in the truest sense of the word, it means to make him ineffective. The death of Jesus made the power of the devil ineffective. Why, you might ask? Well, the answer comes in places like Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, where the apostle Paul says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Or you could look at 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning verse 18. And no, notice that he says, For as much as you know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You know, that passage is one of my... Uh, kind of favorite passages. Of course it points to the blood of Jesus, and that's what really makes it a favorite. But I like verse 18 too. You're not redeemed with money. Well, boy, I'm thankful for that. Uh, I've got a will. You know, some of you've got a will, right? In your will, you're giving stuff away. In my will, I'm willing my bills to my children. If I had to buy my way out of, out of eternal condemnation and into eternal salvation, why, if it took money, I wouldn't make it. That's just not going to happen. But the good news is we are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. And that word precious is our word, uh, we, we'd probably say priceless. Now, I want you to do me a favor today, but I'm going to be totally honest with you so that you know exactly what's going on here. I want you to search through all your change in your purses and your pockets. I'm looking for a penny. That's all I want, a penny. And truth is, I'll give you $5 for it right up front. It's a 1909 SVBD. Now, before you make that deal, if you happen to find that penny, the last I knew, it, one of them sold for $1,000. Now, you might say, what in the world? A penny? It's not worth a thousand. Oh, yes. You know why? It's extraordinarily rare. There are only a few hundred of them in, that we know of that are in existence. Now, I want you to think about what God did on the cross of Calvary. Jesus talked about it. We quote it all the time. Do, but do we really hear it? John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son 
that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You talk about precious. He is the only one of his kind. He is the only begotten son of God. That makes him priceless beyond measure. That's what God gave on the cross of Calvary. And by that blood, you and I can stand in judgment uncondemned. Not because we have never done anything worthy of condemnation. It is evident that we have. You know, Romans chapter 3, verse 10, For there is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Of course, we've done something worthy of condemnation. The wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. But because of the blood of Jesus, you and I get to conquer, make ineffective in our lives the sin that we've committed because of His blood that sets us free. So it's no wonder then, is it, that the demon would know, recognize the authority of Jesus Christ. Well, then, of course, the demons, and here I'm going to make a little speculation. They likely knew about Paul because of the power of his preaching. I wish you'd just go back. You don't have to go very far back. Just go back a little way and, and begin to think about the impact that Paul has. Acts chapter 17, he goes to the city of, of Thessalonica at the beginning of the chapter. And he explains and demonstrates that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, this Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And then Luke reports, and some of them are persuaded and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. All right, that was at Thessalonica. He goes on to Berea and what happens there? He preaches the truth there, and they, uh, they search the Scriptures daily to see whether those things were so, and he had an impact there too. Then he goes on to the city of Athens. Now, Athens was an interesting city. And here's what made it interesting. It was a, a city where there were, according to historians, 30,000 idols in the city of Athens. You know how many people live there? 10,000. So that a Roman satirist, we'd call him a stand-up comedian, something like that, he said it was easier to find a god in Athens than it was to find a man. They actually made a law in Athens, and the law was you cannot introduce a new god. Well, you can understand why. Because they built an altar to uh, idol to every one of them. Paul, by the way, didn't violate the law. When they all asked him, gave him the opportunity to speak on Mars Hill, he said, I observe you're a very religious people. I, you could also say superstitious, but very, very religious people. And he said, as I'm going through, I discovered you had an altar to the unknown God. And the one that you worship in ignorance, I'm going to declare to you. And of course he did that very thoroughly. Now watch the end of the chapter after he stood up and preached. And by the way, some made fun of him for what he said. But verse 34, however, some men joined him and believed among them Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Chapter 18, he goes to the city of Corinth. And what happens there? Verse 8 at the end. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. In Acts chapter 18, he goes on to Antioch. And, and there, oh, well, excuse me, <clears throat> there he uh, delivers an important message uh, to them. He's, he's in, in uh, carrying out a, a mission that he had on that occasion, having to do with the, uh, the needy saints. Chapter 19, he comes to Ephesus. 
What happens there? Well, in Ephesus, he baptizes people as well. You turn over to chapter 20, and you observe Paul talking to the Ephesian elders. And when he talks to the Ephesian elders, what does he say uh, to them? He says, serving the Lord with all humility and many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Go to chapter 24. By then, he's, he's actually a prisoner. He's being carried from place to place. And he is taken before Felix, the governor. And as he is brought before Felix, the governor, I want you to notice what he does. You know, he's, he's on trial for his life. Literally, that's what the Jews want. You would expect him to say, I'm innocent, not Paul. Paul just used an opportunity to preach. And so what does he say? Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Now, you and I may not fully appreciate what's going on here. Felix was originally a slave. He got out of slavery and became a fast-rising star in the Roman Empire. But as a former slave, he was vicious. He was a vicious ruler. He was the kind of man who would readily put anybody to death. He wouldn't have bothered him a bit. But Paul does what? He preaches about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, and you talk about impacting the devil, he made even Felix tremble by preaching the word of God. I do not know for sure why the demons were acquainted with Paul, but I've got a pretty good idea, because he's doing a lot of damage to their following. So now we come back full circle to the question that I believe all of us need to answer. And that is, am I known in hell? Or if you want to put it in a positive way, we need to do everything in our power to be known in hell. To make sure that the devil is aware of the work that we are doing. In Luke chapter 24, beginning at verse 46, we find Jesus just moments really before his ascension into heaven. What does he say there? Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among every nation beginning at Jerusalem. What is our assignment? Our assignment is to go seek the lost, tell them that they must repent, and they must be baptized so that they can be set free from their sins. That is our assignment. In Romans chapter 1, Paul shows how serious he is about that assignment. When beginning in verse 14, he says, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you which are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. You have right here a beautiful community. You live in a beautiful part of God's world. I don't know if you take that for granted or not. But when I, every time I come to this part of the, of the world, I see the beauty that God has placed here. This place is filled with, with very good people. I'm talking about if you're talking about it in the way that we human beings think, they're kind, they're considerate. Why, the other day, you know, my wife either used a walker or a four-footed cane, and we're, we're extraordinarily slow uh, going from the car to... To, to go inside somewhere and eat, maybe use the restroom, whatever. We have people all the time that'll run and hold the door open 
And they, they're, going, they're already almost gone, but they run, hold the door open. And when they do that, I, you know, I'll call out to them and say, now, we're kind of slow. And I said, that's all right. You just take your time. No problem. you got good people here. But how many of them know the truth? Does your neighbor know the truth? When I was a young preacher, at my first full-time pulpit work, North Little Rock, Arkansas, I lived in the preacher's house, catty corner, across the street from uh, a very, very kind man. He was retired, had a little farm somewhere uh, up in Arkansas, somewhere else, but most of the time he was home. I always got kind of tickled by him because I'd go out to work in the yard and he'd come out and just kind of watch, you know. And I know what he was doing, at least I figured it out later. He was looking to see what it was this young, stupid preacher was going to need to be able to take care of the yard. Because I didn't have next to anything, you know, at the time. He'd come over there and help me, no matter what the need was, he'd help me. Very kind, wonderful man. We developed a great relationship. In fact, so great that this young preacher was afraid he'd do damage to that relationship, and so I didn't ever really talk to him about his soul. One night, in the middle of the night, I, I woke up, didn't really understand why, looked up on the ceiling of our bedroom, and I could see flashing red light. I got out of the bed and looked, you know, through the blinds, across the street, catty corner, was a fire truck and uh, an uh, emergency vehicle, an ambulance, across the street. I began to pull on my jeans, and I, I told Teresa, I'm going to go over there and see if I can help. And as I stepped out the front door, the gurney came out of that house with the sheet pulled all the way up. I will never have a chance to make that right. Do you have friends who need to hear the gospel? Don't wait. I can promise you if you're as kind to them as you are to me, you're not likely to make an enemy. They may not obey, but you will have done the one thing you could do for them that might help them to see the truth. You will have explained to them that the blood of Jesus is the saving power, that that blood was left in Christ's death, John chapter 19, verses 31 to 35, and that the way to get to the death of Christ is in penitent baptism, Romans 6, 3 and 4. And when they find that blood, they can be raised to walk in a new life. Lots of folks like to talk about born again. Well, there's the way to be born again. It's the only way to be born again, by the blood of Jesus. Don't wait to tell them, let's start to impact the devil so that he knows who we are as a church. But brethren, you know what? It doesn't really stop with those outside the church, does it? Look at the book of James with me just briefly. James chapter 5, beginning at verse 19. James is closing out his little epistle when he says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the air of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now, he's not talking about physical death there. We've all got an appointment with physical death. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. I'm not going to escape that. You're not either. Doesn't matter who talks to me, it's still going to come. For me and for you as well. He's talking about that eternal death described in Revelation chapter 20 beginning verse 11 and going to the end of the chapter, he's talking about the fires of hell. That's what he's talking about. There are brethren, perhaps right here, maybe even in this audience today, who struggle with sin. They didn't mean to. They didn't set out to do it. But they've struggled with it. They need you to kindly plead with them, to tell them, we'll pray for you. 
If they're afraid to come down the aisle alone, tell them, I'll go with you, brother or sister. I'll take your hand. We'll go together. We want to impact the devil in the brotherhood and outside the brotherhood, making the brotherhood bigger. But in order to do that, we've got to cause them to know who Jesus is, the Son of God. We've got to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ so that people will know the way to escape the powers of the devil. If you haven't been doing it, what better time than right now to come as we sing?